Welcome back to the Heinz 57. I'm Scout Stan and I'm going to tell you about all these great videos we have coming up. These videos are set up so that you can get catch up to all the videos you might have missed. Yeah, I know, it's a bad pun. But with that in mind, let's get directly into uniforms. Now the first video we have coming up is talking about patch placement on the shirt. There are patches issued, whether it be rank or camperies or all the different patches that are out there. They all go in a certain spot. So here's a video about where do I stick this patch? Patches, uh, they are amazing, but they have specific places that they go on your uniform. Now the uniform is unique. The uniform, you can wear patches on your uniform for different things. In the past, and, and by the way, I'm going to put a little link up here. In the past, I had a video about uniform tells a story. It's true. You look at a uniform and you can tell what that leader has done, what they know, what they've learned, how much they can be of value to your unit. Something to keep in mind. So a uniform is really divided into four quadrants. Um, obviously, the left and the right sides, whatever, you know, the left and right sides uh, have a pocket on the front and a sleeve. And typically the right sleeve or the right pocket and the right, the right sleeve and the right pocket and the left pocket and the left sleeve. Those are the four quadrants. Um, now I'm going to put up video, I'm going to put little, little things up here, diagrams, so that you can get an idea of what we are talking about. But before we get into where the patches go, um, the uniform inspection should always be uh, done in any unit to be constructive. Okay, We don't need to single out individuals that have no real choice. You know, when it comes down to Cub Scouts and even troops, the parents put the patches on. <laughs> okay, so it's not the youth. They didn't put it in the wrong spot. Somebody else did. So we need to be constructive and try to motivate and give them resources so that they can do it the right way before they have to move it around. Now, below, right down there, Below is a uh, inspection sheet for packs, troops, and crews. So definitely download that. It's right down there. You can do it. Just hit that button and download it. Give it out to all of the new parents that are going to the scout shop or going online to get the uniform shirt and to make sure they put the right things in the right places. Now there's a lot of things out there like Patch Magic, which is um, a great little foam sticker type material. I'm not sure what it's made out of, but it's Patch Magic is out there. You also have adhesives and cloth glues and hot glues and you name it. There's a lot of ways to get around sewing patches on, but you have to follow the instructions instructions that comes with that material. Don't use stuff that's not meant for that. Okay, You can't just take a glue or adhesive or epoxy and expect that to hold a patch on. It might hold for the moment, but as soon as it goes through the wash, it's gone. Okay, So make sure that you use these things appropriately. And some patches, they never move. Once you got it on, it's on like a merit badge, once it's on the sash, it's on. It really doesn't leave. But some patches, like rank and all the other things that are involved in a troop, those things change as often as the wind. So you need a way to remove it and put on the new one as you go. So you need to have that involved, okay? Nothing beats needle and thread, nothing. Okay, uh, everything is, is, is inferior compared to needle and thread. 
That's very easy to do. And I have seen scouts that have made the effort. And it, it, you know, they didn't know any different. They used really thick thread. It almost looks like they lashed the patch on, okay? <laughs> so that's a, that's, hey, they made the effort, okay? And that's, that's a critical thing. I even had a board review once with a scout whose patch, their rank patch, was literally upside down. Now, that's okay. Okay, I thought, ah, at least he made the effort. He put on the last one, and he went for the border review. And uh, we're looking at that going, um, why is the patch upside down? And he said, well, I sewed it on in the car. <laughs> he was wearing the shirt while he was sewing it on. So, you know, at least he made the effort. And that's why you need to be constructive, okay? Now, since it was sewed on, it was easy to to basically cut it loose and then put it the right way around and sew it on correctly. That was all a part of being able to sew it on. Now let's talk a little bit about the four quadrants of where things go. Now we're not going to talk about the history of scout patches, but just keep this in mind. No matter what the patch is, if it's appropriate for that position, that there's no such thing as it being discontinued okay there there's just a matter of of using the patch appropriately and it needs to be in the right spot now let's take a look at the right pocket the right pocket typically it has in the very middle of the pocket has what they call a temporary insignia. This is where you would put things like district camperie patches. Uh, a lot of times these would be on a dangle. Uh, as you can see here, this actually has a, um, a string that's been sewn in to the top so that it can be dangled down below. Now, a lot of times these will flip over. So you need to make sure if you're taking pictures or something that they're not flipped over. So they're temporary. That's a temporary place. Right above that, the flap is really where the OA flap goes. Now you can also put two other things. The totem chip or the fireman chip can also looks like it looks like it, but it's like an OA flap, but it also can go on in that space. Um, that would be in a temporary position. As soon as the scout goes through uh, elections and the ordeal, they wear the flap. Right above that is the insignia. Now the insignia is Scouts BSA, or it could be Boy Scouts of America, it could be any different ones. That's usually a patch or embroider that is actually part of the shirt when you get it. So that you really don't have to worry about. That's part of the shirt. Now typically before, uh, just above that would be any kind of interpreter strip, a venture strip, okay? That's venture patrols are still around. So you might have a venture strip that would go there. And then above that would be your nameplate. Now if none of that, the nameplate would be right above the insignia. Now, at the very bottom of the right pocket, there's a space reserved for the recruiter implement. Now, the recruiter position is a great thing that you need to promote within your unit. Very important. Now, in, in my district where I'm at, our membership uh, team quite simply says that you can wear that after you have signed up one thousand scouts so that's something to look for adults are allowed to wear it if in our district in our council we're where we're allowed to wear it if we've signed up a thousand okay and it takes years <laughs> okay but if you're in membership you should be a recruiter so that's kind of the the whole right pocket of where things go now let's look at the left pocket. The left pocket for leaders, the actual pocket area, is reserved for youth to put their rank. Adult leaders do not have rank that they put there. That is left blank in respect to the youth.
The youth get to use that space. That space is where their first class, uh, their scout, uh, eagle, all of those ranks are placed. At the very bottom of that pocket on the, on the left side is the arrow of light. If they have received the arrow of light, that's where it would go. Now, with that in mind, on the very top of the pocket, not the flap, but the very top area is where square knots would be put. Youth can earn the religious award, which comes as a square knot, and that can be worn at the very top. Now, adults will put all of their square knots there, typically no more than three rows of three. So the, the knots that are there are usually um, placed right above the pocket. Now, right above that is where they would put service stars. And then just a few inches above that is the uh, WAMU, the World uh, Scouting Movement uh, blue logoed patch would go. And then there's different rings that you can put around them. That is optional. So that goes right above. It's to remind scouts that they are a part of a world organization. Okay, well, since we're on the left side of the uniform, let's go ahead and talk about the sleeve, the left sleeve. The left sleeve at the very top seam of the sleeve is where your council strip or your council patch would go. Now, there are councils that have different shapes, but most of them are in the chevron shape that goes right at the top edge. Right below that would be a veteran or... Um, there could be founder that could actually be right below that and that's right above the number of the unit and the numbered unit depends on if it's Cub Scouts or troop or crew the color will be different so that's important then right below that would be your position whatever position you're with if you're with um, say for instance uh, you're an adult leader and you're a scoutmaster of a troop. That would be the position patch. And just below that would be the trained patch. Now the only time the trained patch wouldn't be there is if there's a pocket. Some uniforms have a small pocket on the sleeve. The pocket itself would have the position patch and on the flap of the pocket would be the train strip. So it would actually go. If you go further down the, that side, there is uh, awards that can actually be put on there. Uh, the Arrowhead Award, which is a uh, commissioner's award, can also be worn in that area. Okay, now on the other side, the right sleeve should be the American flag. Now that comes with your uniform. It may be, I've seen, where this might be embroidered directly into the fabric. So it may not be a patch. Some of them have patches, some of them are embroidered in. But the American flag, like it was back on the left sleeve with the council strip, should already be there on the right side. Right below that would be your patrol. Now your patrol can have different awards and they will go around that. So this whole identity on this side says that you're an American Scout. Right below that you would have whatever patrol you're with and then you would have your uh, unit award. Okay, So those are the three things that would be in that space. So as far as the four quadrants of the uniform, that's where things go. If in doubt, ask other leaders. So that way they can help you get more out of the uniform. Now, uh, the right pocket area, as you go even further up, you might even have things like uh, World Jamboree, Jamboree. Uh, you may have other insignia up there. Uh, I know for OA, when you go to NOAC, which is like the Jamboree for the Order of the Arrow, they wear something up there too. So... There are exceptions, but they will let you know. So 
that's generally where things go on in uniform. And for adults, we need to be cooperative with one another and work out uniform inspection and be constructive with it. Don't try to put someone down, okay? Believe me, if you have earned 20 knots, I don't mind if it goes all the way to your shoulder. You've earned it, okay? <laughs> so, it's, it's amazing how there's definite places on a shirt where you put those patches. But, you know, that's not always true. Throughout history, scouting has had different uniforms and different places to put the patches. There are all kinds of uniforms. So for the United States, we do uniforms. So here's a video about the history of the Boy Scouts uniform. And we've had a uniform since day one, uh, even prior to day one, okay, <laughs> we, we had a uniform. Um, so uniforms are, are an amazing thing. This is actually a requested video. Uh, so I've had several people ask about uniforms in the past and so on. So we're just going to do an overview of how today's uniform came to be. Now back when scouting started in the United States, uh, 1910, uh, from that time to about 1922, the uniform uh, that uh, Baden-Powell originally thought would be the best was uh, a long sleeve shirt with shorts. They thought that that was just a very common thing that he's seen over in Europe and, and it was very common. But in the United States, most uh, young people did not wear shorts beyond the age of, say, 10, okay? Uh, that was for kids. That was for little kids. Uh, shorts were, um, that, that just didn't match up to the culture in the United States. A lot of the uniforms that came out at this time were based on the Great War uniforms, uh, World War I. Uh, so a lot of that surplus that was around was being used. And because of that, as you can see here in the picture, there was mainly they would wear knickers with leggings and uh, with a button-down uh, choke collar jacket or coat. Uh, this was a pretty common thing. And, of course, the campaign hat, which was very popular um, during, during the Great War. The adults would often wear a Norfolk jacket. Uh, which had lots of pockets, uh, big buttons, uh, and of course they would wear knickers or trousers. Now a lot of this stuff was made of wool, <laughs> so it was very warm, uh, very water resistant, and kind of itchy and scratchy. So it was a little, it was one of those things that you kind of had to, the culture, it was a part of the times. Now from 1923 to about 1930, uh, the knickers uh, were being slowly phased out. Now the, the leggings that they were using was basically underwear. It would literally went from the toes to the waist and the knickers would be pulled over it and they would either be buckled down or uh, tied down right above the knee. So it was a very, it could be very uncomfortable, uh, especially made of wool. <laughs> the BSA at the time uh, introduced uh, a long sleeve khaki a uh, shirt uh, that would have a long sleeve. Uh, in fact, at that time, they would often put merit badges on the sleeve. Uh, they didn't have a sash. That came later. Uh, that was something that was part of the uniform that was being produced at the time. Now, as you can see in this picture, there are many different types of uniforms going on at the same time. From 1923 to about 1930, um, they were slowly phasing out of the coat and knickers. Um, you see them back in the 30s and 40s, uh, but this is one of the main things. Um, when you're going through a lot of the literature about the scout uniform, it evolved with time. Uh, scouting was going through some... Uh, significant changes in the uniform. 
as far as, uh, say for instance, the neckerchief that was being introduced in about that time. Uh, but it was a full square. Uh, you folded it on the on the bias and then didn't flipped it end over end and that's how you got the neckerchief. Uh, or you just folded it up, folded it on the bias and then put it around your neck and put some kind of um, a neckerchief slide on it. That, that, was, that was being introduced in about that time. Uh, from 1931 to 1943, there was quite a few different variations. Uh, in fact, uh, we have a photograph that I'm going to put up here. This photograph actually is from Boys Life magazine. Um, I believe it was 1934. Uh, that's where this photograph comes from. And you will see there are three different outfits, as they call them. Uh, outfit A was the long-sleeved green um, shirt with shorts. Uh, there was also stockings. Uh, there was a garter and a tab that actually went on the garter. Uh, that held over all the way through to um, 70s. Uh, so it, it's been around for a long time. Uh, then there was the outdoor uh, gear uh, uniform, which had short sleeves. That was really the only big difference there. Uh, the pockets were a little bit different. Uh, they, all these pockets, by the way, had a button down or a pleated front to them. Uh, that, was, that was important. And then, of course, the outfit H, which was the highest level outfit H, uh, which literally had the knickers. And uh, instead of leggings, they used stockings. So that, that stayed consistent. So you can see how this was um, morphing, changing, evolving, you know, over time. Uh, and it became a regulated uh, uniform shortly after that. Now, starting back in the 30s, they were starting to use new materials. Uh, nylons were coming out. Uh, they were phasing out a lot of the wool products so it wasn't as warm. Uh, especially in the summer and in warmer climates. Uh, cottons were starting to be put in. Uh, there was uh, different blends of cloths that they used, uh, mainly to make them more durable. Uh, as adult leaders, we know our uniforms are very durable. They last a very long time uh, compared to other clothing that's out there. Uh, in 1944, uh, they were in the war uh, to about 1965, the uniform was pretty consistent. It was the uh, short sleeve shirt uh, with the button down pockets and of course the neckerchief and the, the shorts. And they kept the stockings. Uh, like I said earlier, it, they kept them until the 70s. 1966 to about 1972, uh, that's when all of those older fabrics, cottons and uh, wool and uh, uh, different types of materials were being phased out. They were very expensive at the time. Uh, right after the war they got really very expensive and they were phasing those out going towards uh, more breathable fabrics whether it be cotton or nylon or, or mixture. That was something that was going on and it during that time they started to introduce a dark green uh, leadership core shirt. Uh, the dark green was also used in Explorers. Uh, that was a big thing that the Scouts had at the time. They still have Explorers, but it's been focused on police and fire and rescue. So it's, it's, it, it, it still exists. Uh, Learning for Life is still there. But back in the 60s and the early part of the 70s, Explorers could be of any kind, okay? Uh, almost like a crew is today. Uh, they would wear a dark, uh, a very dark green, forest green uh, shirt along with the standard pants and, and socks. Uh, they also had a dark green tab on their socks. Now the tabs were uh, knitted and they went over a garter that held the socks up to right below the knee. So that was, that was the uniform of the day. Now in 1973 to about uh, right before 1980, uh, they had gone through an entire redo of standardization of patches that were on the uniform. Prior to that, 
patches could come uh, unbordered. They just are woven onto a piece of fabric that the scout or the tailor uh, would fasten on or sew on uh, in a manner to get rid of the extra fabric. Uh, they, they standardized it all with borders and in so doing shapes came about. That's where we get our current day uh, council strip shape, the, the chevron shape that goes on uniforms today. That comes from that time period. In the 1980s, uh, all the way through to 2008, um, the new uniform was designed by Oscar de Laurent, uh, a designer, a French designer, that put together the two-tone color, the tan shirt with a dark green or uh, olive green pants. Um, he also introduced things like uh, shoulder, sh shoulder tabs. Uh, that was a that was a brand new thing uh, back in 1980, and it has evolved and matured and actually come through as the uniform we know today. Since uh, 2009, cargo pockets have been very common on the shirts. Uh, you'll you'll also see things like zipaways, uh, which is where the trousers can be turned into shorts. Uh, very easily. They even have zips on the side uh, of the trousers where you can actually take the lower part off uh, over boots. So that was a new thing. Wicking fabrics that actually wicked away heat and uh, moisture. Uh, that was a big innovation. Uh, there's even shirts today that have a grill or a, 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 a mesh behind behind them it's a seam that's open and it allows heat to be vented out of the clothing the clothing is very uh, durable it's not quite denim but it's that type of uh, firm cloth uh, you can sew patches on and off and they last for years uh, just recently I replaced uh, some uh, green pants that have gone through the wash so many times they turned gray. I mean, <laughs> I had had them for 16 years. <laughs> no tears, no, no repairs needed. It was, I, this is very durable stuff. It's expensive too. So always having that class B underneath is important. You got to have that class B so you can take off your expensive shirt and be able to do activities that are more strenuous where you get your nice shirt messed up. So uh, that's, that's always important to have. Now, even though some of the parts of the uniform have changed uh, over time, uh, just to stay within the current uh, usage of our youth and our adult leaders, uh, it has changed, but it's never been discontinued those uniforms are still just as valid. Uh, in fact, we are a very proud organization, of, especially of our history, and the uniforms represent that in many ways. So we need to encourage youth, if they want to wear the old uniforms, that's fine. They can wear them. Uh, it's, it's a tradition. Old uniforms are wonderful to see, especially at flag ceremonies, and that is just a wonderful thing to have uh, available, uh, that, that nostalgia, that, that history that we, are a, that we represent a big part of it. So that's something to seriously consider. Position ranks, uh, different positions in the uh, troop, or crew, those don't really go away. They've never discontinued, deprecated, got rid of, uh, disallowed, okay? Once you've earned that rank, whatever it looks like at the time you've earned it, that's your rank. Uh, that's, that's important. I know of many scouters that have their youth go through the program and they use the rank patches of the background colors changed. Uh, this was big in the 70s. Uh, the background colors or even the different shapes of patches can be worn. Uh, they've not 
done away with those. They're not disallowed. You can wear them if you've earned them. That's, that's a huge thing. Uh, if you're representing something that is not current, you could represent it by a past patch. That's totally fine. These are things that are, that are not done away with or disallowed. These are things that are encouraged for historic reasons. I know for a fact that I've given professionals old patches that was in my family, and it was very meaningful. And they wore them proudly on their uniform as a thank you. It was, these are, these are hugely significant things in a uniform, in, in wear, what you're wearing. Very, very important to keep in mind. Now with all that, keep this in mind. It would be inappropriate to use a current day rank patch on a uniform representing the 1920s. They had similar ranks, but the patches were different. So you really can't use current day patches. It just doesn't look right. It doesn't fit in. It, it's, it's, it, it's a microwave in a 1960s kitchen. It doesn't work. It is, it, it's not nostalgic, okay? <laughs> now, granted, if it's a first class rank, you could wear the day, the old one on the old uniform. Totally fine. If you've earned the first class, you could definitely have the scout wear that. That's totally fine. Now, uniforms. We have talked about uniforms. In fact, I'm going to put it up there. Uh, uniform inspections should be kept constructive. We need to encourage scouts to be up to date as much as they can on their current day uniform. If they're wearing a nostalgic or historic uniform, that you have to judge individually. So you shouldn't see any new patches on there. But it should be the patches of that time. So if you're wearing a patch, uh, say a new council strip, on a uniform that's representing the 1930s, that would be incorrect because they didn't have council strips. They might have a council patch in some of the larger areas, but a lot of them had red strips and was just white lettering that said where the area was. So you have to keep that in mind when you're doing uh, inspections, especially if you're doing inspections of old uniforms. You have to go back in history and see what would be appropriate on that uniform. Look at the pictures. Um, fascinating, fascinating history about the scout uniform. And wearing the uniform, whether it be a historic uniform, whether it be something that's from your childhood, as adult leaders we do these things to kind of inspire the future. That is amazing. Over time, I actually wore some of those. I'm wearing one right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> you probably said the same thing. It is amazing. They never out, those are never done away with. They're always current. All uniforms. Mind blowing. Anyhow, lastly, we need to look at some of the unique patches that a lot of leaders are kind of obsessed with, and that's the beautiful square knots on the uniform. Now, square knots actually tells a story. It can tell you what skills the leader has done and what type of training they've had. It can all be told just by seeing and recognizing the different square knots that are on the uniform. Before you put comments about the square knot, the square knot is the knot that we have imaged in the in the patch, okay? That image, the square knot, is also known as a reef knot in many parts of the world. And it's also known as a Herculean knot, okay? I bet you didn't know that. And it's a joining knot. So that is the knot that we use for leadership or representing leadership. Now the crazy part about that is that the knot is easy to accidentally sew it on upside down. And there is some rules as far as how that should be manipulated on the shirt. 
Now the square knots that are over here, this is on the left side, the wearer's left side of the uniform, uh, that would be the viewer's right side. So that's where these go. Um, there can be up to nine before you run out of space on that side of the uniform. Now, I've seen leaders with more than nine, okay, and that's fine. That's fine if they have a shirt that's uh, accommodating so that the patches aren't moving too far out of space. That's fine. And honestly, if you have more than nine, wear them. <laughs> I honor that, okay, so please, please go ahead and do that. Now, that may not be uh, appropriate for an inspection, but believe me, if you have more than nine, shouldn't be a problem. Now, as I mentioned earlier, it's very easy for the patch to be sewn on upside down. So I'm going to put up an illustration and we're going to talk about how to determine the appropriate positioning of the square knot. When looking at the rope on the patch on the right, the rope coming in from that side will have a loop that will be over or top of the left ropes. Now this can be difficult if you have multiple colored ropes, if it's all the same color like in the eagle, uh, in the eagle square knot, the eagle scout square knot is all the same ropes, red, white, and blue rope. So it's kind of difficult to figure out which ways the correct way. Now before you sew on a square knot, make sure you check a chart and make sure the chart is right. I've seen charts out there that had it on upside down. So make sure that it's right the right way up. Now if you find a scout leader that doesn't have it on correct, say for instance it's upside down, that's okay. You don't have to go crazy on them, okay? So just just mention it and maybe they can take care of that next time they get something sewn or next time they get the sewing box out. Now one of the neat things about a square knot, once it's earned, it's permanent. It's part of the scouter's record. If the scout leader has earned the square knot twice, they don't wear two. They actually wear the first one and add devices, which are small metal pins that go through that patch. And that states what type of re-earning of that patch is, has been done. Now there are four categories of knots and these vary and some of the knots are actually earned when the adult leader was a youth. The first category is achievement. That would be like Arrow of Light or the uh, Eagle Scout medal, the Silver Award from venturing, quartermaster from sea scouts. So these are these are square knots that can be worn in achievement. Now some of these have different backgrounds. For instance, sea scouts may have a white or a blue background. And then if you're a NISA lifetime member of NISA, as an Eagle Scout, you get a different border. So there are different variations. The next big category is awards. All three of the life-saving merit awards are also represented as square knots. The Medal of Merit, the Medal of Heroism, the Honor Medal. Other awards like Community Organizer, District Award of Merit, which oddly is not a square knot, Silver Beaver, Silver Antelope, Silver Buffalo, Silver World, Unit Leader Award of Merit. The third category of square knots is recognition. Typically this recognition is something that is earned as part of being involved in a unit. James West Fellowship, Hornaday, The Youth or the adult religious knot. William D. Boyce, Scouting Service, International Scouter, Venturing Leadership, Order of the Arrow Distinguished Service, 
Distinguished Commissioner Service, Commissioner's Award of Excellence, Special Needs Scouting Award, Alumni, Cubmaster, Cub Scouter, Weeblow's Den Leader, Tiger Den Leader, Pack Trainer, Den Leader, Scouter Award of Merit, Speaker Bank. The fourth category is training. Now typically these are earned by the adult over a period of time. Uh, there's typically requirements of training that they need to take and activities they need to do in order to achieve these square knots. Doctorate of Commissioner Science. Philmont Training Master Trek. Scouter's Key. Scout Leader Training. Now, keeping that in mind, all four of these categories, none are better than others, okay? A lot of the ones, if you have to grade them, a lot of the ones that are early on, such as achievements, those are things that are done when they were youth. That scout leader has gone through that. Now, if you look at my set that I have, the, the bottom row, the one that's closest to the pocket flap, is actually... <laughs> All earned when I was young okay all three of those were when I was young so that says something when you see that on the uniform you have to judge those four different groups and you know kind of it, you can kind of figure out where the individuals experience comes from now here's another thing once the the like I said earlier once an adult leader earns that square knot it's permanent and that's even if it's no longer around, if it's no longer available, if it has been uh, phased out or deprecated in some way away from scouting. If they've earned it, they can still wear it, okay? <laughs> that is valuable, and it definitely goes on the pocket. Now, if you know a scout leader in your unit or at round table or other units, and they've been in scouting for a period of time, they don't have any knots there might be one of three things that are going on there it could be quite simply that they're not being recognized for their service and their training so check into it make sure that they get recognized it is important to keep adult leaders happy and motivated that's one of these things that just is really important now the second reason is they might be hesitant for some reason or shy so don't make a big deal of it but find out what's going on now the third thing it's a new shirt <laughs> they haven't had time to put their patches on now new shirts we're going to talk a little bit about that later in this season we're going to talk about the uniform my uniform to be exact and where all these patches and what's going on there uh, but in wood badge we staff often wears a very plain uniform shirt. No, no, none of the none of the square knots. No, no troop or anything. It's all troop one, very plain. And there's a reason for that. When you go to Wood Badge, you go through a process of leadership. When you're learning leadership you can't really focus on people walking around with a whole bunch of patches on okay you can't read their book of all of their patches of what that means you have to go by your group okay and it's a development thing so it's a distraction if they walk around with all of these books and people will say oh let's ask this person let's do this let's go over this way no they need to find that within their own group so it's intentional so we we wear uniforms that have no no indication no story so that they develop their own story so that's a big thing with wood badge now i know that you've got every single one of those memorized <laughs> no don't go out there and try to do that find out what you're looking for and then find out what patch or what patches you need to be looking for out there in the world okay if you need Eagle Scouts to help mentor life scouts to become Eagles 
finding them by knowing what that patch looks like is is critical as an adult leader. That's amazing. For a long time, I thought they were all square knots. I didn't know there was an overhand knot. Did you? So, you know, that's one of those things. That is an amazing thing about the uniform and all the different patches and all the different things that have to do with scouting. Keep up that good hard work that you do. I know you put in a lot of hours. You're a volunteer like me, and you put in a lot of hours. And you're stretching your knowledge of scouting. That's what's cool about these videos. So keep up that good hard work. Your scouts benefit from you being an expert about all these different subjects. That's one of those great things. Keep that up. Keep searching for the for that information. That is key to being successful. So until next time, I will see you on the trail.